so wonderful. Thank you so much for joining us. Just means a ton to our, our community, the Awakened Company, for you all to be with us to celebrate the re-release of the Awakened Company, which was a bit of a surprise. So thank you so much for contributing, for being in community, for actually helping to create that. So many of you have had such an active role in helping to create and build our community. So thank you so much. So I'm gonna turn it over to Kelsey and Kelsey is going to be our moderator for the event. And I'll turn it over to you, Kelsey. Well, thank you very much. So I am so excited to be having a conversation with Kath and Russ, Russ tonight. I um, I just realized it would be nice if like we had the two of you kind of like on screen, but I think people will just have to put the um, the speaker view on. That that might help if you switch to speaker view, then you'll be able to kind of see both of them talking. Um, so actually, yeah, before we actually kick off and do introductions, why don't I actually pass the ball back to Sherry and she's just going to do land acknowledgement. Okay, hello everybody. Um, first and foremost, congratulations to Catherine on your book re-release and to Russ as well. Um, I would like to take this opportunity to acknowledge the traditional territories of the Indigenous peoples of Treaty 6 region and the Métis settlements and Métis Nation of Alberta, regions 2, 3, and 4. Uh, we respect the histories, languages, and cultures of First Nations, Métis, Inuit, and all First Peoples of Canada, whose presence continues to enrich our community. Um, before we really begin, I'm going to guide us all through just a quick grounding so we can all be present and ready to take in everything that Catherine, Russ, and Kelsey have to say. So let's begin by placing your feet on the floor and you're welcome to keep your eyes open or closed. I'm just going to have everybody take a full breath in and a full breath out and imagine or keep the focus of your breath towards the crown of your head acknowledging your brain the center area your third eye space and bringing that focus down into your eyes into your cheeks your mouth and your neck and bringing the focus of your breath into your shoulders into your right arm your right hand your right fingertips and moving that focus of your breath over into your left arm your left hand and your left fingertips. Another full breath in, focus to your chest, your belly, and your sacral. And bringing that attention into your right thigh, your right calf. Moving over into your left thigh your left calf, attention on both of your feet, feeling the earth, the ground beneath you. Take one more full breath in and a full breath out. And you can open your eyes. I'm gonna pass it back over to Kelsey so we can begin, thank you. Thank you for that, Sherry. I'm glad that you did that because I am way too high strung <laughs> to take people through that. So um, so first, yeah, I just want to say thanks to Kath and Russ for having me. So my name is Kelsey Hahn. I'm the CEO and co-founder of a company called Monarch. We're an early stage technology company based out of 
Calgary, we are automating the science of leadership development for a new generation of leaders. And um, I'll, I'll talk about Catherine and I's relationship in a second, but we are partnering with thought leaders like Catherine and actually helping them convert um, all of their learnings and knowledge like the Awaken Company into actually digital micro training into our application web platform. So lots of exciting stuff that we have going on. Kath and I met, so I, I do like to say that Kath is 100% responsible for me landing in Calgary. I'm originally a Saskatchewan Prairies girl and 100% wouldn't be here without her. And I, I connected to my first job in Calgary through Kath and I always describe it as being very serendipitous. I don't think the job was posted anywhere. So it was kind of just like a word of mouth thing and I landed where I was for almost eight years and it really started the trajectory of Monarch. So thank you for everything, Kath. I can pretty much thank you for everything in my life other than my two beautiful girls. You probably can't take credit for that. <laughs> um, all right, so that's a little bit about me. So Sherry, that everyone, you just walked us through that beautiful land acknowledgement and grounding. She is one of the creative and operational forces behind the Awaken Company. Russ, as many of you would know on the call, is was a collaborator on the Awaken Company and is a thought leader, world-renowned thought leader in the Enneagram. And I think we will be talking a little bit about the Enne what the Enneagram is for those of you that don't know what it is. And then Kath, I hope yeah. most people here know Kath Bell. So she is the oh. author and founder of the Awaken Company. Um, her yeah, focus it's, it's, really... It's, it's Just remind everyone to mute. All right, sorry, just reminding everyone to mute. Uh, so Kath, Kath is the founder of The Awaken Company and her focus is on helping ignite and sustain the fire within and through helping organizations create healthy cultures with through her practical experience, her wisdom traditions and business research. So I will say that we are gonna try to um, keep this as an open dialogue. Please, I'll be watching the chat. Please ask questions throughout. I'll be taking notes. Um, and we'll intersperse them kind of throughout the night and, and also more specifically at the end, we'll open it up to a little bit of Q&A. Um, but first, yeah, so big congratulations to Kath and Russ on the re-release. Re so the original book was released in 2015, which, yeah, almost eight years ago, hey? That's like, that's a long time. Um, I do remember when it came out, but let's hear from Catherine and Russ about kind of the story behind The Awakened Company, the book, and kind of what started you guys down that path of wanting to write it. Thanks so much, Kelsey. So I'll, uh, I'd love to share the story because it's quite a story. And I thought before I would share the story, uh, I wanted to read the dedication that's on the front page or one of the front, front first few pages of The Awakened Company. So for all those who have felt listlessness, disengagement, fear, anger, frustration, and pain in their work within organizations. And for one of the loves of my life, Kent Brown, and our sons, John and Michael, who have my heart in their hands. Readers, you now have our minds and hearts in your hands. Thank you for choosing this book. So when I wrote that last sentence, I am meaning all the people who contributed to The Awakening Company because it very much was and is a community book. So Russ has been a huge influence in my life and really helped with this. And I'm going to explain how he kind of got into it. Uh, and as well, the community, like Otto Scharmer from MIT, Julian Barling from Queens, Rosemar Cario from Patagonia. These thought leaders all contributed their wisdom to the book. So it really is, in essence, a community book. And not only that, it's for everybody who's here tonight and them contributing to this community. I just wanna say, thank you, thank you. And our next, we have a playbook on the way and it's gonna begin with three words. I love you. 
So I'm just going to say that again. I love you. And it's through that love that everything happens. It's truly amazing. So picture this. I'm in a dimly lit cafe in New York City. And I'm sitting with my colleague, Carolyn. And it was like a lightning bolt struck me right through the top of my head. And the message was, you're to write a book called The Awakened Company. So I turned to Carolyn and Carolyn's not on this call because she's working right now. Otherwise she would be, she's gonna get the recording. Uh, I turned to Carolyn and I said, Carolyn, I'm going to write this book called The Awakened Company. And she was like, yes, you are. You totally are. So then she immediately went to work on actually trademarking it. And right now I'd actually give away the trademark because I'd prefer people to actually use it and use the material in a profound way. So it's kind of interesting the way it just kind of dropped in. And it started off as a recruiting book and it was terrible. So I showed my business partners at the time, you know, here's what I've written. What do you think? They're like, oh, we're like, this is terrible. You can't publish this. It was just terrible. I'm not a natural writer. Like I really am not. It's been practice, 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 practice. So then I kept on working at it and working at it and working at it. So there's one thing that I would just suggest for everybody. Tenacity is always helpful just to be so tenacious and what you believe in. Uh, and so then I, I'm like, I want a Cartoli's publisher to publish this because it's so different than most business books. You know, at that time, I think just before I'd been cited in Harvard Business Review, et cetera. And I'm like, you know, I want Eckhart Tolle's publisher to publish this. Well, so I asked her, she said no. And she said no multiple times. And then I finally convinced her it was time, she's got to publish The Awakened Company. Meanwhile, I kept on working on the book, kept on working on the book. And my aunt, Ruth, who is no longer with us, said to me, Kath, the person you need to work with is Russ Hudson, because he will bring the clarity of thought that you need into this book, because it's all over the place. And so... I asked Russ, thinking, you know, there's no way he's going to say yes to me. There's my rejection structure, Russ. There's no way he's possibly going to say yes to me. To um, And lo and behold, he said yes. Now, Russ, why did you say yes? What made you say that yes? Well, that's a, that's a big question. Uh, but usually why we do stuff is kind of mysterious. You know, just something arises in our heart and we just... There's a yes appears. If I was to come up with rational reasons, there were probably a few floating around. One of them was I felt it was very important to have writings, teachings out there about the possibility of us being more conscious and awake in the workplace. It seemed kind of obvious since we spend the vast majority of our waking hours in our places of employment. These days, that's maybe right where we are right now, sitting in front of a Zoom screen. But, you know, for many of us, for most of history, we've been going to offices and going to workplaces. So it seemed to me that if we didn't start having cultures, work cultures that were sympathetic to the development of human beings, then what we could get from companies would always be very limited and keep producing to use Otto Scharmer's expression, results that nobody wants. Mm -hmm. uh, so I was very aware of that. And I had taken a couple of stabs at doing some kind of a business related book when I was uh, working with Don Riso, my writing partner, uh, but we just never found the right combination. The, what I knew was that I needed to work on this with someone who was as savvy in their expertise in organizational culture as I was in the Enneagram and inner work. I needed somebody who really knew their stuff. And so I would just listen and there were a lot of offers that came my way. But Catherine and I, we knew each other already. We liked each other. I was so impressed with her energy, her, her fierce commitment to doing this and her considerable experience in working at very high levels of business there in Canada. Mm -hmm. So I just thought, well, maybe this is the way to go. And um, and then we started working and I, I did my best to provide some good ideas and s clarify and sort of uh, orient some of the, the uh, there was a ton of good ideas, but they, they needed a little massaging to get them 
kind of focused in a certain direction. Uh, but you know, it was it was um, my entree into trying to bring some of my background, which is a lifetime of doing inner work, to a, a huge population of people that I know desperately need it. And I thought Catherine has the heart and courage and wisdom to be a, a fellow messenger of, of that possibility. So that that's sort of the, the, the quick version of, of uh, that, why I said yes. <laughs> what, Russ, I'll never forget. So Christopher Papadopoulos also worked with us on this project. Yes. And we're in New York kind of going through, I had a really, I wanted to get a lot of stuff done. We had a lot to go through in terms of the chapters. And then Russ is like, all of a sudden he goes, let's go to the American Museum of Natural History. I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. But lo and behold, we reset, we went to the museum. It added perspective. It added a freshness to what we were doing. So there's a lot of when when working together what I learned a lot so the book is also about how to actually do this so blue, blue era as many people know was a profit 10 in in Alberta profit 200 in Canada best workplace so it became like the petri dish the practical know-how of how do you actually do this how do you actually become more aligned to the vertical at work to the present moment so we were doing mindfulness many decades ago, as I know some of our clients on who are on the Zoom can attest to. This was not, so I feel like we're always kind of pushing new ground or new ground is always emerging through what we're doing. Anyway, Namaste chose to publish it and it um, it's just such a joy that it's being re-released in paperback. So thank you. Yeah. Russ, what do you want to say? Well, something else about the way you approached it that was I found compelling and I still do. And I think it's it's like a first step of something that I hope continues to develop. The big problem I see with companies doing the sorts of things that would lead to the kind of environment we're talking about is that A, they have to be willing to invest a whole lot more in their employees than they have hitherto. I mean, there are a, some brilliant exceptions to that rule, but we all know what I'm talking about. And two, there's always going to be a certain trepidation, which you did deal with in the book and you continue to deal with, which is simply that if you get an awake team, they're not going to apply their brilliance and talents to crappy results, to crappy products, to things that harm the world and harm the communities. They're going to want to shoot higher. So leadership has to take responsibility. If we're going to have a conscious team, it has to participate in something bigger than just our the profit margin of our little company. It has to become part of a living and intelligent system. It has to be part of the solution. And I think you hit that note very beautifully in, I know you do it in your teaching, but it was that book, it's in the new playbook. But I, I think that people don't understand that log jam. Mm -hmm. And I think it's one of the reasons why this doesn't happen as much as often as we might wanted to because leadership gets afraid you know gonna get a rebellion on our hand we're asking people to do a bunch of dumb stuff people don't mm -hmm. want to do dumb stuff anymore mm -hmm. so we're we're kind of talking a little bit about you know the book but let's let's just for those that may not know what maybe Kath, you can talk to us a little bit about what the awakened company model is and and why it is so important because we're kind of starting to get into that yeah. mm -hmm. so the term awakened, let's first address that. I believe it's awakening. It's just awakened sound better for the book. Really, it's all about awakening. So it's present, it's emergent. And an awakening organization is one that solves a real problem and does so not at the expense of humanity or the planet. And if we are to think about and consider a drop in the ocean. So if you think about a drop in the ocean, and that drop then ripples out and ripples out and ripples out. So the first drop is awakening ourselves, as Russ was talking about in terms of leadership. So awakening ourselves. And Kelsey, you know this more than most people know this. The majority of people are disengaged at work. So we have a system that's causing problems right from that first drop. And then if we look at our relationships, and again, Kelsey, you know this, the 
people are disengaged and also they rate the worst time of their day as their time with their bosses. So we have a whole bunch of boss holes who aren't meaning to be boss holes, who actually are trying to do the right thing, but we have to teach another way of being and doing. And then if you look at the next layer, the majority of businesses don't survive past nine years. So our system is just asking to be revised, revisited, recreated. And the system that we use has impact on those different rings, focusing on how do we awaken ourselves? Mm -hmm. So, and how do we also to lean into that, Kelsey, we've talked about this many years ago, lean into that vulnerability. So for example, leading mindfulness, I'd often be the only woman in the boardroom. I'd be sweating, thinking, oh my goodness, what am I doing? I'm leading a whole bunch of men through mindfulness when no one had even heard of it at the time. And now, now it's become common. So it's fa fabulous. Like we're getting there. There's a lot of hope. So how do we awaken ourselves. And one of those portals, I believe, is the Enneagram, which is self-awareness. And the research shows the more self-aware leaders are, the higher performing they are. So we increase our self-awareness either through, I know you're into the big five, Kelsey, big five and the Enneagram portals for how to actually be more present. Mm -hmm. If we can't be present, if we can't, don't know ourselves, what our work-ons are, what our strengths are, it's very hard to be a good leader as well as we will go ahead, Kelsey. Well, and, and, and three sixties, right? Like, you know, strong assessment, whether that's personality or behavioral assessments, essentially, I think the research, I think it's Adam Grant's research that's done that suggests that, um, those around us that, that have good perception and insight into our work behavior are more than twice as likely to be more accurate in rating our behaviors than ourselves. Mm -hmm. So if you think, you know, how you're showing up, you probably don't. It's so, so true. And right. then when it's we- true in the Enneagram, true. A, the, a large number of people get a first hit of what they think is their type and they've got it wrong and then they get attached to being something they're not. But, you know, the, the, just to make one quick point here, another way that, quote, spirituality goes off in a couple of ways in workplace. One is people conflate it with religious belief and it's not. What we're talking about is not that. We're talking about being an awake human being, which religious traditions talk about, but it's not, we're not telling people what they should believe about anything. The other thing is simply that most people do not know themselves, much to your point, Kelsey, and, and Catherine misaddressed this very much. The Enneagram is a portal to that. But the other thing here is it's it's which I'm forever trying to bring and, and why we didn't overtly put it, make it about Enneagram types in, in the book is the Enneagram was never meant to tell people who they are, was never meant to be that. It's a lazy shorthand that's turned into an easy way for people to impress people, but that's not what it's about. It's to, it's more, it's to be used more like the big five. It's meant to be used as a way to see, whoa, here I am doing this certain pattern that when I let it run rampant, it creates mayhem for me, for my colleagues, for you know everyone who cares about me. So I just wanted to bring in that idea that, that we're not selling spiritual beliefs. We're trying to get people to become more aware of what they're up to. And in doing that, we become more available to actually connect with each other in meaningful ways. Just wanted to say that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's so true, Russ. And there's also the invitation for pause. So for us to really drop into our being. And then it's almost like the universe gives us answers. And I think that's why the majority of people get their ideas outside of their organizations. They don't get them when they're at work. They get them when they're outside because they're pausing and it allows for space for something else to enter. So the invitation in terms of engagement is know yourself, give space, do practices, know whether you're coming from your more awakened place or your more asleep place and to change and bring intention to your work. Intention is huge. You know, intention is huge. And I don't think we pay enough attention to it as leaders is what are we, what is the energy we're bringing into our workplace every day? What is our aim? 
And with attention and receptive awareness and action or inaction, very powerful things can happen. So that's the invitation. And then let's talk about relationships. And Russ, you have a great relationship thing that you and I use practically all the time, which is I'm very real. And Russ, you are more competency-based. So what do we do? And talk to people about that, because that's a relationship hack that every leader should know. <laughs> well, you know, one of the things that I've, I've learned over the years is when I've worked with teams and organizations, generally speaking, they don't want to just learn nine Enneagram types out of the gate or just get nine descriptions and identify with one. There's not much you can do with that. I know people who do that for a living and uh, more power to them. But I always felt that there's this, you know, incredible um, hate to use the cliche toolkit in the Enneagram. There's all these interesting ways of looking at things that I thought could be very immediately applicable to teams. And one of them is this idea that was something I came up with. Um, and now it's part of the great ancient lore of the Enneagram. It, it came from me in 1994, actually. But it's uh, <laughs> this idea of what we call the harmonic groups. And there's three of them. And Three is an easier number for most people than nine. And it's just basically how we deal with disappointment when things don't go our way, and particularly when we have conflicts. So I, I noted that three of the Enneagram points used what I call positive outlook. They're positive reframers. If things are looking bad, they cheer people up. They show possibilities. They inspire. And they're good at it. And that, and it's nice to have those kind of people around. Uh, if you're dealing with trouble, keeping some kind of sense of a, a positive context and what you're dealing with is super important. The issue is some people, that's all they want to do. And so if there's any kind of bad news or anything, you get the la, 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 la. I don't want to hear about it. You're being negative, right? And then there's, then we see if people meet us around our love offering, how we think we're going to solve the con a conflict, we're happy and we're engaged. But if we don't feel our offering is met, we go to anger and the other person's an idiot and we all get angry and reactive. So that, that's one way is the positive. The second, there's three Enneagram types that are what I call emotionally, the emotional realness group. And their idea of a solution to problems is a lay your cards on the table speak your mind. What's going on? I'm upset about this. I'm anxious. What are you feeling? I want to know where you're coming from so we can be real here. And that's another totally valid and important approach to solving problems. Some people, that's their specialty and they invite people through their realness. They invite other people into a more authentic and honest conversation. And boy, you need that at work too. But these folks, when they're running their racket, that's all they want to do. And if they don't, if things aren't real to their taste, they provoke people and then they get the second phase, which is the anger and, and fighting and you're an idiot. And, and, and they feel, well, at least it's real now, but they've actually damaged the relationship. Okay. So the, that's, that's another one. But they're the ones who are really good also at inviting people into authenticity. The third group is what I call rational competency. And our, our approach is, okay, there's a problem. Let's look at it. Let's break it down. Let's analyze it. Wow, we're doing this and we're doing that and that and that don't work. So let's not do that anymore. Let's do this instead. And so it's like you, you break it down, you understand it, you're rational, and, you, and then you move on to the next thing. Okay, back to what it, we're, what's important here. And there's three Enneagram types that do that. And they're and when they're really good at it, they're really good at offering rational solutions, having people think of stuff, look at different possibilities and so forth. But when they're not doing so great, that's all they want to do. And then they're real judgmental. They judge the positive ones as flakes and the emotional real ones as children. And you know, okay, you guys can go with all your stuff. We'll some of us will have to solve the problem around here. And uh, so, you know, that, that's another way of proceeding. But of course, that judgment does not exactly win friends or influence people or help the team. Mm -hmm. So the whole thing I, we teach is how do you, as an individual, 
learn these two other languages of communication more skillfully? How can I meet people where they're coming from instead of insisting that they meet me where I am, mm -hmm. right? And then as we get better at it, then that becomes something that we work out on a, on a relationship level and a team level. We got two people that both know that and they know what each other are doing. They get much better at communicating effectively with this. Uh, when I worked with Don Riso, my writing partner for so many years, he and I damn near killed each other a couple of times in our arguments and fights. But it was that understanding that and how we were miscommunicating to each other that reeled it back in and got our work relationship to another level. So I, I know it, it works from experience. And that's one of the things that we put in the Awakened Company, although beautifully disguised. <laughs> yes. I, yes. I love that. I, I feel like, Russ, you were describing um, my relationship with my husband there. Like, alt I'm an entrepreneur and he's a lawyer. So like, ultimate optimist, ultimate pessimist. <laughs> the la, 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 that's real for me. Um, so we're talking obviously a little bit about um, people and working with people and how to understand people better, but what are some of the tools that we can use or, or how do you talk and if you can share about creating awakened organizations? Yeah, for sure, Kelsey. And I just want to hit on one more thing about the relationships is one simple way to improve our engagement is to positively notice each other. So the people who are most engaged are those who are positively noticed. Those who are least engaged aren't noticed at all. Those who are negatively noticed are the middle in terms of engagement. So even by negatively noticing another, you're actually improving engagement. However, if every day we say thank you and we notice something about our colleagues that's amazing, it goes a far way. And so just another thing to add in terms of the relationship piece Mm -hmm. um, so in terms of organizations, which to me is very interesting because I think organizations are the only way we're actually going to solve the problems that we face and by organizing differently and by leading radically differently so that organizations become more like a forest, become more alive, more vibrant, more healthy and have all the seasons within them have the fall, the winter, the spring, the summer, to more model nature and what is true and what is real. And almost they can become like an organism themselves, a collective organism. And how do we do that? First of all, we need to energize our organization. So often we'll say, you know, what's your vision to CEOs? And they won't really have a clue or they'll give me a financial number. And that is a recipe for disaster. So one other hack is the research shows two thirds focus on corporate culture, one third on financial results. So we need to bring the humanity back into our organizations. And what's interesting is what gets measured gets managed. So how do we manage and measure culture is hugely important. So having a clear vision that everybody knows is one simple thing we can do. And then having... I call them missions. So if we were to say our vision is, is to get to the moon, let's say, the missions are all the things we actually need to do to get to the moon. So strategically having very clear goals in all the different dimensions and aligning around those goals and having accountabilities around those specific goals and objectives. But we have to keep in mind our inspiration is the vision and we need to celebrate our successes so as an organization how are we baking in the whole celebratory notion the way we work together the way we what happens when we achieve our goals so the first pillar is energize energize the second is sustain well what does that mean people need to understand what the structures are in their organization and often they don't they need to know how what their role is in the organization and have clear metrics for measuring the goals um, as well. They need to feel connected. So recently we are working with the team and man, did they have incredible processes, but there was no connection between the people. So the processes felt dunk, dunk flat because the connection is so 
needed. So the formation of healthy relationships. And when I looked at the IBQ of over a thousand leaders, less than uh, 6% had a preference to spend kind of deeper time with another person. So I think that's also a hack in terms of building healthy organizations is to actually spend time one-on-one -on -one talking about real things. Another invitation. So this sustain is to get connected, to have the structure and also to ensure this will hit, will stir you, Kelsey, values. Values need to be clear and not aspirational, but actually living in the organization. So for example, when we were speaking about this, I'm like, it's gotta be playful. It's gotta be purposeful. And it, you know, I was and passionate. So they've gotta be living. And as leaders, we need to reinforce this and reinforce these energies. And the third pillar, which is so missing is regeneration. And that's creativity, innovation, stability, space and time. With the overarching focus for the organization being two thirds corporate culture, one third on financial results. The worst performing organizations, those that focus solely on financial results. The middle performing, those that focus on culture only. The most powerful organizations, those that focus on both. I think, I think another way that we can understand the relationship between organization relationship and is, is it related to what Catherine was saying about a new concept of leadership. It's not really new from one point of view, but it's, it's not this kind of heroing kind of idea of leadership. It's being an example in, in how we are, what we are. What I see in a lot of organizations around what stops the whole process of energizing is the, the perceived disparity between what the organization is doing and what the fantasy goal mission strategic view is, which is comes across to people as just like so much PR, which is generally what it is. Mm -hmm. is PR. It's not the real goal of the organization. So there has to be a kind of realigning process. And I also think very hard for this to happen if there isn't buy-in from leadership. The leadership has to set the tone of how this is all going, not from the view of like top-down leadership, but from the point of view of offering a new model of how we're operating here that does energize people and is sustainable and is innovative. You know, it's, it's, uh, this is why without the inner work, it's damn near impossible. Mm -hmm. Our ego structures are not going to provide that. We have to be able to drop in a little deeper into the creative parts of our, our psyche to be able to find the places that can actually break some of these old molds and offer a new way of operating. Russ, that's so true. And also to have the perspective that everybody in our organization is a leader. Because the moment we call, call somebody a follower, their behavior actually de degrades. So the invitation is for us to, to realize everybody is a leader and to let that have a cascading effect. Right. It really is a different way of operating because we're so used to the more traditional hierarchical perspective. And I do believe in leader. We need leaders. Like I went and sat with Occupy on Wall Street and it showed me why we need leaders. We can't have, it can't be leaderless. We need leaders and we need everybody to be an empowered leader who believes in what the organization is creating. Because really, as Russ was saying about inner work, like work is actually a huge part of inner work mm -hmm. because we don't check ourselves at the door. We don't check our egos at the door. We we're bringing everything and it's false to believe otherwise. Yeah. I think it's, 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 you know, the way that we talk about leadership too is like, the, you know, what you're saying, which is there's influence and then there's authority. Everyone in your company has influence. Mm -hmm. And when you think about really effective and strong leadership behaviors, you know, not personality, but actual behaviors, um, these are things that everyone can benefit from, you know, exceptional communication skills, emotional intelligence, critical decision making. These are all the things that drive really strong leadership behavior. Um, 
I want to switch gears into kind of like what is the next evolution when you think about awakened organizations or awakening organizations? What what do you what do you I'm gonna go off script a little bit here. Oh what, good. I love what, it. What do you know? I think about to the complexity that leaders face today. Um, you know, we had the scandal, the like FTX thing happen. Was that one or a week or two ago? Um, I mean, there's just like massive complexity that leaders are facing in the world today. How does the idea of an awakened organization, how has it changed or, or maybe what has not changed, you know, eight years later? Well, number one, I think that, uh, our intention matters as leaders and for leaders to have a name. If we don't have an aim, we will be led our consciousness, our energy will be led. So to begin with intention, Kelsey is so important. And we can say, yes, it's, it is very complex. And it's also, we have this moment. It's what we have. And that's as simple, it's as simple and as complex as that. So what is the smallest little thing we can do? And that will never change. So that is always a constant. And I believe the collective energy of people is increasing and I, that makes me very hopeful. And it's also very challenging because I think we can improve collectively and, or we could actually degrade collectively as a result because we all are influencing each other. Russ, do you have any comments on this that I'm, it's the smallest little things that matter. Yeah. And, and I, it's, it's things can turn on a dime depending on the nature of how we're showing up for each other. And the stakes are certainly raised when you're leaders, which is why I think also support for leaders. It's a, it's a two-way street, you know, in what ways are this, is the organization supporting the well-being of its leadership, keeping the leader connected with the pulse of what's going on? I like the distinction you made, Kelsey, about influence and, and uh, authority. Uh, one of the funniest sketches they ever did on SNL that is one of everybody's favorite comedies is about a situation where there was authority but no influence in the other people. It's more cowbell. <laughs> it's true. We need more cowbell. Everybody knows we don't need more cowbell, but there's no influence. There's no. There's just an authority demanding something that's pushing it in the wrong direction. But that happens when leaders are cut off from their constituency. So when there isn't that sense of relatedness with the community that I'm serving, you know, it's true. It's just as true in organizations as it is in spiritual communities. Once you got a spiritual leader, that's no longer in touch with their constituency. You got a, a troubled situation brewing. Mm -hmm. And I don't see any much exceptions to that yet. We keep setting up organizational structures that function that way. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's very interesting, but I think that we're, we're looking at also how, I guess when I, I'm drawing from what Catherine is saying, the changes that we need internally are not enormous, but we underestimate the inertia of how things have been done. To really change and embrace a, another methodology, even if it's a small thing, is not easy. And again, I'm, I will come back to our personality can't do it. Our personality is a collection of presets. Autopilots does perfectly fine as long as nothing comes up to change the circumstances. But life will keep bringing things that change the circumstances. And now more than ever. So this is where I think that the inner work piece of it, the self-awareness piece of it, the presencing, what's going on in and around me, part of it is not some kind of added on groovy luxury. It's not a privilege. It's not, it's, it's vitally necessary at this point for the survival of companies to be sure. But I would even suggest for our civilization, if we don't figure out how to do things a little different, you know, but look, you know, how many of us know what we need to do in terms of recycling and, and carbon emissions and all of that? We don't know about it, but to actually make the changes in our life, it's, it's rare for, to find people who can do that consistently 
We give our gold, ourselves gold stars for the one or two things we did do. But we know, even that when we know it, it's still very hard to shift these mechanical processes. And that's why the whole idea is not presence as some sort of escape hatch from our human situation. It's bringing the lights up around our situation so we see what we're up to what's actually going on what are the dynamics here the the only other thing i'd say about all this and this is the hard sell of it before we get to the good stuff there will be bad news for the company to get to a good place you got the company will need to see its dysfunction right and to the degree the company's not willing to look at that, there's not much to be done. Just the same as an individual. Somebody who thinks they're already enlightened, lots of luck, buddy. You know, I'm sure you still have an ego and I'm sure it's still doing stuff. So there's a there's a process of, of in self-inventory that is part of this. You know, it's even in the 12-step programs. You don't get to do all the fun parts of 12 steps until you do the fearless moral inventory. But there's a way, which is self-criticism. It's not putting ourselves down. It's just honestly seeing what we've been doing and recognizing what works about that and what are the limitations of that with a kind of honesty, realness, positivity, and competency in the sense of how might we do this better? Mm -hmm. But that's, that's but I'm saying that's rare. People tend to coast on what has been done. It's just as true in the Enneagram world or the spiritual world as any company I've ever been in. Mm -hmm. And I really do think it's important for us all to be able to drop in a, in a moment's notice. Yeah. Give ourselves space and it allows for better responses and better being. I've received a private question from somebody that I'd really love to address because it's a very very powerful question. One observation is the leveling off of men in emotional intelligence and the Enneagram community. What is your take on this and what's our work to address this trend? It, that's a brilliant question. What's super interesting is the majority of awakened company clients are men and men are very comfortable sharing with us privately what's going on. And so I just want to put that out there that I think there's an invitation to do this type, some of this type of work when people feel safe with the other person because it's vulnerable work to have that safety. Uh, one of the things that I have found really helpful is that I rely on business research a lot. So using having data that supports things that I say engages men at a different level and they're comfortable with us. So Russ, what would you take say as a man, how can we improve? And Kelsey, I'd like your perspective too, emotional intelligence and the Enneagram community. How do we engage? Because it really is important that we have diverse community. It creates a healthy forest. Yeah. So how can we, you know, extend the olive branch? And Kelsey, I'd like your perspective from the EI perspective. I think that, uh, you know, much of what you just said, I would agree with. Um, I think that having a context where the magnifying glass is not immediately on the self is a good way to start. Uh, I think men have been largely conditioned in most modern cultures, whether Eastern or Western, to have their you-know-what together in all circumstances to be the protector the one who makes it happen and so forth. Under those kind of conditionings, when you still weren't actually, in fact, given the right material to actually know how to carry that off, you're forever a scared kid with a very, you know, impressive bulwark around you. Now, then anything that threatens the perception of that bulwark is going to be rejected, laughed at, touchy-feely, woo-woo, you know, I've been in rooms with that many times with the, the folded arms, but actually it's, it's a way, there's a way also that I think men are desperate to be seen and known. I think in some cases, just like in the women's movement, some of the initial movements had to be women talking with women. I think in the same manner, there are situations where men need to talk about men 
where it gets beyond the slapping each other's butt with the towel in the gym. It's not that kind of connection. It's not that, yo, bro, all that nonsense that men do to sort of shield themselves from the raw experience of sitting with other men and going, we don't know what the hell we're doing. Mm -hmm. Yet everyone expects so much from us. And women who are in positions of power certainly understand this, but this is the traditional male roles that whether men are successful or not, they're branded with that expectation and they struggle with it. Mm -hmm. So I think they're not quick to go to things that might, they fear might dismantle their bulwark. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And in fact, they're right. <laughs> because The inner work will dismantle their bulwark. But what they don't know is that inside it, there is a real power and a real strength and a real brilliance that they haven't found yet. Or maybe they've touched it a few times. That's the other thing I do. I help them see the times in their life where they didn't do that mm -hmm. and something amazing happened. Yeah, I, I think it's interesting. I mean, Kath, you, you said like most of your clients are men, M me too. And I think that's, you know, I was on a, like a female entrepreneur call today and there was like a bunch of females around the, well, there was all women, but they were a bunch of different businesses. So one was in the transportation business. Um, one was in, oh, I, one was in the film business and everyone said, actually our buyers are mostly male in every industry. And so that's a product, that's not, you, you know, that's kind of across the world. And so I, for us, our approach has been, um, to what you said, Kath, like appealing to research and performance. Um, and I think like when we can tie so much of these positive things, like purpose, um, the importance of diversity and inclusion, when we can tie it to performance, which by the way, every piece of research out there basically validates that companies perform stronger when they have a stronger purpose, when they have a clear vision, um, when they take care of people, when they operate with more diversity and in inclusion. And so when we can make that link, I think it becomes really clear. Um, and then I think you, once you, you get that off the table, you can start to really break down all the other benefits, which we know are many. Mm -hmm. Um, so I'm just looking at the time. I, I want to go to live Q and a, we haven't had as many in the chat. So does anyone want to be a brave soul? Come off mute, um, and ask a question to either Kath, Russ, or both. And while, while somebody chooses to ask a question, I just want to acknowledge Tamara there in the chat. She's our partner on Awakenly, which is the app to awaken your inner muse. So it's also something that we're creating, which is really fun to use technology as a force for good. So yeah, I just want to honor Tamara there and her comment. So I'd love, we'd love to hear from you. What about a question? This is complex stuff. It's not, it's complex and it's simple, as I've said. Yeah, it's simple, but it's not facile. Yes, yes. That's a great way to put it. Anyone, anyone? I'll keep going if nobody has a question. Feel free to drop it in the chat or message me privately as well. Um, so, okay, what's, what's the next step for both of you, for Catherine, for Russ, in your work um, and with the book? So we've got a playbook that is on the way. So the Awaken Company is really the how, like why do we want to create awakening organizations? And the playbook is the how. It's incredibly practical. So that is coming up. Super, super, super excited about it. Uh, we have the app, awakenly.app. We also have... Um, a book we're doing that we're working on now on the Enneagram and creativity. And Russ is really leading that. And I'm the backdrop for support for that. Uh, so that's kind of what we see next. Um, we're working with um, Queens University. I'm really excited to bring the playbook and the book into the university. Uh, well, it's already been brought into the university, but to help grow it in a very profound way to help kind of create more of this cultural organism that I was speaking of. It's where I see as, as the next level of organizations is that 
we can tell what the other person is doing and operating from uh, as we work in different ways, using different senses, more powerful senses. So Russ, how about for you? Hmm. Well, you, you covered a lot of it. Um, you know, we, there's several writing projects. Um, I think a couple of things, it just one is that I'm on this quiet crusade to sort of restore the Enneagram to something that's more usable other than just, as I call it, you know, rather flippantly a filing system for humans. That's not the point. The point is how does this knowledge help us show up in such a way that we can participate more consciously in this world. Our Enneagram point is uh, an entry. It's, it's, a, it's an entry, it's a leverage point for doing real developmental work and psychological insight and so forth. But I'm, I'm really interested in expanding the conversation. And for example, the, the creativity idea is that it seems to me creativity and what people are trying to get at through spirituality comes from the same place, comes from the same layer in human beings. Wherever creativity comes from, is coming from what people are trying to get in touch with spiritually. And there's a lot of people really burned or turned off by religion, but they're very interested in creativity and the work they need to do to sort of open up either one of them ends up being practically the same thing. So then, for example, your Enneagram point becomes an entree into creativity and also a study of what shuts down your creativity. I think a lot of people can get that who don't necessarily grasp the the religious or the spiritual impulse at first. Uh, the, it's, you know, it's sort of disguised in a way. But I think that I'm just interested in finding how this knowledge we've accumulated can help people live and work together more intelligently and creatively, which is the aim of the Awakened Company project and book yeah mm -hmm. so i think joey put her hand up joey yeah i did russ and it's interesting because i think you just sort of uh uh spoke to what i was thinking about was with the creativity book or what the teaching is about creativity and the the new playbook do you guys see those as working together I see those two things as being sources for each other. I'm curious what you both have to say or think about that. Yeah, I mean, just at first blush, they this both ideas came out of the same kind of mix in a way. It came from, you know, conversations that Catherine and I were having. And, you know, just it they just spun in a little bit different directions. But the idea of, of what's needed in both cases has certainly some similar fragrances, shall we say. Yeah. And I would say that the creative stream is what helps to fuel an awakened organization. So without that creativity or that energy uh, there an awakening organization will fall flat so the creativity book uh, i really see as a portal as a window to being of service to what we're also doing in the playbook so the playbook is very it's a very tactical book it's like here's how we actually create these to give people who don't know how to do it because I've done it so many times and we've done it so many times, gives them a very practical workbook. Okay, here's how you do this. And the creativity, that stream is what fuels it. It's almost like it energizes it, awakening organizations in a different way. So I do see them as working hand in hand together. And the only the future will, will tell, but that, uh, Joey, your question, I hadn't really thought of it before. It's a really great question. I think yeah, I think that uh, what you're feeling into there is absolutely, yeah, that's bang on, bang on, Joey. And I hadn't thought of it that way before. Yeah, that's what I was feeling, Catherine, that, that sort of fusion, so, yeah. Yeah. 
Very much so. Very much so. Great question. Well, I, I'm just looking that we're at time and I want to be really respectful of people's time. I think some some people have had to jump um, off to other meetings I see in the chat. But before we close out, I'd love to give everyone an opportunity and just invite them to share what they're grateful for in the chat. This has been super inspiring discussion. Um, I don't know, Kath or, or Russ, if you have any kind of last minute parting thoughts as people kind of drop drop their comments in the chat. Yeah, just that, hmm. I would just say that there's always the opportunity to get, as we get more present, to look beyond the categories that we tend to stick everything in, especially categories about ourselves. And that's how the Enneagram can either help us or hinder us, where we get identified with categories instead of using them to grow beyond them. So I was, I would just say to be aware of what I assume is already the inevitable truth, right? To sort of begin to see that starts to get those creative energies going and get me back in a direction of being able to contribute something alive and fresh to whatever endeavors I'm involved with. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Russ. And I really just wanna say a huge thank you to everybody who's been on this call with us. And just also to say that you are that creative force. And without you, none of this would really be possible. So we're co-creating this field together. And it's so important, I believe community and to build community is our way to solve the world's greatest challenges. And it's only by acting together healthfully that we'll be able to do it. And just a huge shout out to the incredible team, Kelsey, Sherry, Russ, Joey, our clients who are on this call, friends who are on this call, service providers in this call, like just huge thank you and just big celebration. And you mean the world to me, you mean the world to us, and we mean the world to each other. So please keep going. I know it's not always easy, but please keep going. The world needs us. So thank you. I'm not sure I can add anything to that. So thank you everyone for being here. Really enjoyed and honored to be part of this conversation. Yeah, thank you everybody. Bye for now.